Welcome everybody to today's seminar. Uh, my name is Jerry DeGrice, Director of Inspiring Place Landscape Architects here in Hobart. I'll be the moderator today. On screen with me are our panelists, Amanda Ballmer, Director at Wax Design in South Australia, Brendan Papworth, Director at Papworth Davies Victoria, David Hatherley, Director at V Design Queensland, Rick McConaughey, Director at Rick McConaughey Play Spaces New South Wales. To begin today, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country where we are meeting and the continuing connection to the land, sea, and community. I pay my respects to their cultures and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to thank Lark Industries for the opportunity to take part in today's webinar. I commend them for their vision to create exciting spaces that inspire everyone in the community to move and play for life and to their engagement with our industry through the support for continuing professional development. As I said today, I'm joined here by Amanda, Brendan, David, and Rick, and we welcome them and we'll be back to come back to them in a few minutes. Just so you know, we can't see you, but we'll know you are there when you post your questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We're looking forward to taking your short, sharp questions and sharing your exper our, exper our experiences with you. Um, when you exit the session, we'd be pleased if you'd fill out the one minute survey that will pop up. Your answers will help uh, LARC with the planning for future events. Just so you know, we've never done this before. I've never done it before. So I uh, just bear with me if I, if I stall. Anyway, to, to get the ball rolling, I'd like to share a few uh, thoughts from my own personal experience of nature play. I was born in Detroit, and it's a city that conjures up in the minds of many people images of cars, Motown music, and ruin porn. Uh, but this was what it was like for me. It was a city of tree-lined playgrounds, American elms arching across the pavement to the horizon, the neighborhood subdivided and built after the Second World War. This is how we played. Ball games in the street, occasionally rampaging through the neighbor's shrubs or sprinting across their front lawns. Not so much nature play as play. We were not, however, without our nature play opportunities. For us, nature play took place on the three unbuilt blocks in our neighborhood, one, two, three, uh, where pioneer trees and weed species had established and builders had left the rubble and locals their garden wastes. All the materials were natural and there was no equipment that we didn't build ourselves. It was truly nature play, not a nature playground. It was, it, it was imaginative, active, immersive, high touch and feel, sensual, seasonal, experiential, challenging, stimulating, and educational. It took us outside our comfort zone with a modicum of fear that would be chased off by some crazy neighbor or the police. I mention these experiences because of all of those unbuilt blocks disappeared during the time of my growing up. This one became a McDonald's, this one a bank, that one an old folks home. One by one, our nature, nature play opportunities were lost, and we had to strike further and further afield to play in nature. And we rarely got there because those places were well out of the bounds of parental uh, approval. Today I live in Hobart in Tasmania. Here, real nature play opportunities abound. There are still places where kids can actively immerse themselves in the bush in real world opportunities limited only by their imaginations. Just last weekend, for instance, I stumbled on this setting and someone's idea of a shelter. One of the many humpies that I found as I continued my ramble that day. Unfortunately, nature play opportunities like those of my childhood and now my adult life are disappearing, cleared for housing, destroyed by bushfires, or evolving due to climate change. So as a first thought for today, I'd like to remind us that as professionals responsible for the outdoor world, we need to do all we can to save nature so that true nature play can thrive in our cities while we build nature playgrounds for those who don't have access to the real world of nature. So with that little rant out of the way, I'll open the floor to the first questions to our panelists about the intent and design of nature playgrounds. I remind you to post your questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So fire away, please. Um, just to begin, though, we'll start with a few questions that came through uh, prior to today's session. And uh, the first of those came from, two of them that really 
comfortably set together. One from uh, Isaiah, I think is how I say the, say the name, A-S-I-E-H, and another from Catherine. And essentially they're asking the question, how do we convince parents that the level of risk involved in nature play is um, acceptable? And uh, how do we stop, in, in trying to address risk, how do we stop from making the uh, experience too man-made and too, too built up? So, and the, the questions ask, are there any ways to mitigate this? Um, Rick, you wanna cope with that? Oh, thank you, Jerry. Um, I think just kicking off, um, and I'm out of my natural habitat too in this, and so welcome everyone, and thank you for taking time to come and share with us. Um, the, I think one of the things to bear in mind is that not every play space can or should cater for every taste, and so, um, if parents find some of the opportunities presented in nature play not to their liking, uh, bearing in mind that we should also be very seriously considering what's to the child's liking, then there is typically in most uh, council areas or in most regions an alternative space to go to. So we can't possibly hope to create a space without gigantic budgets that caters to everyone for every aspiration. Um, um, so if someone's finding a nature play space a little bit challenging or a little bit unpredictable, which is entirely its intent, um, then there are probably going to be more structured kind of opportunities in other areas that might be more welcoming to what the parental expectation is. But bearing in mind, obviously, that um, a diversity of play is, is best and perhaps taking the child to each one and introducing them to them and see how they explore them and finding their own way is, is an opportunity. But there is always going to be an inherent risk in play. That's part of the nature of the experience is to engage with uh, challenges and experiences and to um, explore your aspirations through them and that will occasionally have um, risk involved. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Um, and now questions come in from Terry along similar lines. And um, she asks, can a space be nature play if it's constructed using off the shelf items? Um, Brendan, you want to follow up maybe? Uh, yeah, th thanks. On that. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I, th I think with, in terms of having off the shelf items and incorporating that with nature play, one of the key aspects of, of making that work is to have natural things in, in, in concert with off-the-shelf items. I remember there was a park where my young boys used to play in Northcote, um, was called Johnson Park, which had a off-the-shelf playground with mulch and um, many different types of equipment and slides and so forth. And one of their favorite places was just off to the side in a garden bed area with really well planted shrubs and trees and so forth. And they would move through that area and, and make their own play. Um, and, and, and find little places where they could get hidden and let their imagination run wild. So I think one of the important things for nature play to work with off the shelf items is, is to have other um, uh, pieces uh, to the edges or um, incorporating um, uh, around, the, around that playground so that kids can find their way. Thanks, Brendan, that's good. And, and yeah, coming back to Rick's earlier comment about the possibility that we, we need to provide a variety of different kinds of uh, play experiences. Uh, Melissa asked, is there a, is there a place to, uh, do, do we think that there's an opportunity to create different categories or different types of nature play to better define what features might be present in each space? Um, Brendan or Rick, do you want to come back to that? Um, I'm a little timid about checklist kind of things. And I understand that it's, it's, it can be incredibly helpful to um, formulating a space and trying to think of all the things that might be included. I think it's really, it's, it actually gets to the nub of the question of what a nature play space is. And there is some perception um, put that, you know, a nature play space is a kind of a lineal space, but built out of timber instead of steel. Um, and that's not entirely well, that is one aspect of it, but um, a nature play space incorporates nature and obviously can't emulate nature because it's artificial 
by virtue of being made by humans. But it, it has a lot of aspects of nature and it would typically have a lot of loose parts and a lot of moving things and a lot of unpredictable things and a lot less kind of running on rails kind of play happening in it. So I think the nature play ultimately is, is probably grew out of trying to replicate what nature provides, say, outside my window in the Blue Mountains, um, but for a inner urban area. So it may not, it can certainly incorporate equipment and all sorts of other opportunities, but it's very specifically about putting in natural elements um, and allowing kids to engage with them, particularly using loose parts and engaging with natural materials in a, in a, right. as a natural a setting as you can. Sorry. Right. Well, that, that begs the question that Michelle has asked is, um, how do we convince decision makers to endorse and run with the creation of nature play spaces in area that is currently unused? Um, Amanda, you've developed some quite challenging play experiences for children. Uh, David's, David also has some thoughts on that. Um, I'll leave, let, uh, David, you want to go first and then we'll come to Amanda? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I, Michelle, I think that's a really good question. I think it's a question we as designers of play spaces and parklands um, are challenged with every day, trying to convince clients of the value of play. I, I think it comes back to a, a lot of our clients get caught up in the detail of safety, um, risk mitigation, uh, managing maintenance costs, managing capital expenditure costs, and they, they lose sight of what the broader purpose is. And the broader purpose is to create really inspiring play environments for our children to learn and to uh, be challenged um, and can get grubby. And that's the beautiful thing about nature play. Um, so, you know, I think it just comes back to uh, trying to convince them and uh, that there is a bigger purpose. Uh, the bigger purpose is it's about our children and educating our children in a new environment where when I grew up, I don't remember playing in playgrounds. I remember exactly like you were talking about, Jerry. You're playing in the vacant lot. You're playing in the creek. Um, <clears throat> and it's now our young children don't have those opportunities. So our playground environments need to create them. So we're losing focus on what, what the purpose, what the why is. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, good. Um, Look, there's another question here, this time from Alia, or Alia. What are the key elements or factors in designing a successful nature play space, which isn't too prescribed, so it's like any other playground? And I think that that's a really core question that we need to talk about. Um, Amanda, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm oh, sorry I didn't come back to you before. Um, that's all fine. Um, I suppose I would challenge the question and sort of say, um, a nature play space is no different to any other play space. It's, you know, we always find our best projects come when we've actually, you know, challenged our own inner child and then spoken to other children and actually used that basis of information to then innovate and create experiences that are differing and challenging and what is it that makes this playground unique to another playground. Um, and always making sure that we can um, incorporate a gradient of challenge, whether it be in nature play or in constructed play, that will appeal to everyone at some level um, and then making sure that we have a level of inclusivity so that we can sort of include um, and incorporate as many users as possible. Right. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? I, I think that I think that's a really good question. So I think it might be worth somebody else piping up. Yeah. Do you want to repeat the question again, Jerry? Just yeah, so what were the key factors in designing a successful uh, nature play space which isn't too prescribed like any playground? Mm. Yeah. Not to nature. <laughs> I think I think one of the one of the key things where, where you do have the opportunity is to retain existing trees because I think every every child who's grown up and I and, and I know my boys do the same thing. They they will search out a tree that they can climb. So um, I think that that becomes a, a piece of free um, uh, play equipment to be incorporated in any playground and to encourage that. Um, I think that safety aspect is something that's important to push the boundaries of because um, it's good for kids to also um, know their own limitations and to, and to discover things as well. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, just 
we've got a, a people that know Brisbane quite well. We've got a fantastic um, park down in New Farm Park um, with a beautiful playground all built around some massive fig trees. And you go down there on the weekend and it's just teeming with people, you know, with not just kids, but you've got parents and carers in there as well playing with the children, which is the ultimate sign of a great playground. Um, but, but every now and then you'll see the kids climbing up into the tree and onto the branches and you can see all the parents sit back going, oh, are they allowed to do that? Are they allowed to do that? Are they going to get in trouble? And I, I, I sit back and I go, well, isn't that what children should be doing? And I think we as a society have just got caught up with, um, you know, the wrong values. I think we've got to get back to the fact that climbing tree is actually quite enjoyable and quite safe, you know, mm -hmm. as long as you're not going to kill yourself. Um, so, Thanks, yeah. yeah. So that's another great feature, that new farm park, because one of the things that are extraordinary about what nature's doing there is that the fig trees are slowly consuming mm. the um, park benches. And that is, like, that is profoundly, extraordinarily amazing to see when a kid goes in and, and, and a tree is typically a uh, kind of, you know, static kind of thing. And you can see this park bench poking out the side of it that's just <laughs> slowly been overwhelmed by this tree and there's two or three of them as I recall and mm -hmm. all the aerial roots as well it's a great example because there is opportunities there for structured play and other kinds of explorative play and things but just to see the capacity to, for nature to reclaim a space has got to set off synapses going wow how yeah, you know, did exactly. someone put that in there how did that whole thing happen so I, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so Caroline asks the, the big question, how do we define nature play? Is it play in nature, play with natural materials, mimicking natural environments, such as playing in creeks, climbing on trees, or is it something else? So yeah, this, this asks the question, and maybe I hinted at it in my opening, you know, are we designing nature playgrounds? Are we designing nature play, which for me would be playing in nature, and we're designing nature nature playgrounds, I guess. And then, what is the defining, what defines it as a nature playground? Is it the fig tree taking over the benches? Is it simply a materiality question? Uh, I don't know. I'm open that to you know Brendan or Amanda, David, Rick. What do you, what are your thoughts? Um, it's about context, like there's lots of new bush kindies starting up in Australia now, you know, and in that context, a lot of them go off site and, um, and, and develop um, play opportunities outside the boundaries and so, so on. Um, if you're talking about council spaces, then it's about not necessarily giving a standard kind of response, but that sounds a bit pejorative and it's not intended to. As right. I said, there's got to be a whole range of play opportunity. Um, but it really depends about the context. Are you trying to do it within the context of an early child attender, a school, a council? Are you just trying to encourage more children to get out to play outside? Um, I think it evolved for me more because most of the natural spaces within urban centres um, were disappearing and people were concerned that the yeah. entire environment that a child was being raised in was becoming artificial and contrived and architectural. Once again, not majority. That's so good, that's my thought. It's a, yeah. very much about the context. Yeah, I think that's and hard to define. Yeah, it, I think it is hard to define. And you know, it, what, what is actually nature? If if you've planted the tree, is that truly nature, or is nature is, is nature just something that happens sort of organically? Um, you know, and is it more of a structured play versus unstructured play? Because as Jerry sort of pointed out in his presentation. When I was growing up, I remember a lot of vacant blocks around us, um, some under construction, and that they used to be the best playgrounds. Mm. You know, um, there's no hope in hell I'd let my kids sort of play in a, a, a half-built house or construction site now. But obviously, you know, when you're younger, um, and that's where you grow this appetite for risk, and you learn. You know, you learn what's going to hurt you, and you learn what's not going to hurt you. Um, but it, that play was very much unstructured. It was in an urban environment. It wasn't about trees. It was about other things, but it was very unstructured, yet yet really enjoyable. So I question whether nature play... Nature play is very much about getting in, getting your hands sturdy, playing with mud and, you know, all the great things that that brings. But it's also about unstructured play and using your imagination. Right. All right. Uh, moving along. Nina 
has asked. And there's and I thank everybody for the list of questions that's ever growing. Uh, by the way, uh, have, have, gonna try and get through as many as we can. Uh, Nina has asked, how does council allow for nature play while managing risk in city parks? We're keen to add loose materials. However, this pushback from park management and risk assessors. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, Amanda, you, have you got some thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. This comes up an awful lot, um, and I fully get why, um, because especially in our urban context, we have as adults this idea that um, our open spaces need to be controlled and maintained, um, obviously for safety, but to maintain use as well. And I suppose it's this controlling of nature that we are conditioned, which when we then are challenged by the idea of loose parts and nature play and making a mess in a playground, um, can actually be quite a difficult transition for some maintenance departments and councils and also you know, client and community expectations around what open space should look like. So we often find before we start a project, if we get everyone in the room that's involved in the project, not just from the design starting point, but to the end as well, who's gonna look after this playground once it's built? And if we can get the maintenance department and those decision makers in at the beginning of the conversation to fully understand why, we are potentially increasing maintenance for them, but the benefits of the loose parts play or the fact that we've got water play or sand play or whatever it is that's perceived to be creating an increase in maintenance, then at least they can be part of that conversation at the beginning with. And we can then talk about what compromises are required and whether there's sort of steps. You know, we, we start with something small and we can build on that. Um, but also then it's a financial conversation too. So if there's an expectation on increased maintenance, because of the mess that's being made, central mess, then that's a financial consideration too. So we need to make sure that then is engendered into budgets moving forward too. There's no point saying that it looks like this now, we've built it, but we don't have the money to then look after it moving forward for the next 10 years. So if we can have a more holistic conversation about what the expectations are, but also then what we're happy with the space to look like when it's finished, does it need to be completely neat and ordered all the time or uh, do we have a level of tolerance around what this play space might look like because of the benefits that this nature element is providing to our children yeah david you're nodding vigorously <laughs> well I, I think amanda summed that up beautifully I, yeah i do yeah, too i, I totally agree yeah I, and i think it addresses and there's a, a number of the questions here along those lines for instance uh my friend sally taylor wanted to know how you stop it from becoming low maintenance over time you know that gradually erosion of the original uh, desired messiness can be lost and I, we've all seen that happen and uh, I think again that Amanda's answer that you know sooner the better the maintenance teams involved and part of the conversation and that they continue to be part of the conversation will uh, will deal with that which is fantastic. Um, there have been examples where the maintenance crews have got so invested in that that they bring loose parts to the spaces. I know of examples of that. Um, throughout Australia where the maintenance crews will come back in from collecting branches on the weekend and put them into spaces and some of the spaces are getting little bays built in them where loose parts, parts can be put in. But it, Amanda's, other, Amanda's answer also addressed that notion of this balance we're always trying to find between what is an adult need versus what is a child need and the imposition of an adult perspective on what is a safe space or an appropriate space or a thing as a and I'm not trying to set up an entire us them divisive thing I'm just saying that is a critical component that sometimes resources and things that kids might aspire to engage within a space are removed or replaced or taken out of the process to address an adult need. So I think it's a very worthy conversation to be had in every project. And the only way to do that, as Amanda says, is to get everyone in the room at the start and say, well, this is our aspiration for this space. Can we work around how we're gonna make this work in this space with all the various stakeholders feeling comfortable with what we're aspiring to? Right. Um, a couple of questions that have come through one of the questions that came through uh, prior to today, and I want to get back to make sure that we get to those. Uh, one of those came from uh, Tina. Uh, 
And, she, and, and then I see one here also coming up about uh, harsh environments. And the question from Tina and the question from, uh, latter question from Greg was around how do we implement nature play in hotter climates, such as dry, arid desert environments, as opposed to temperate climates? Because a lot of the examples we do see are from temperate climates. And um, Amanda, you're there in hot, dry South Australia. You must have worked in a desert at least once. Um, any thoughts? <laughs> Well, yes, um, and it's very cold here at the moment though, so it's, I've got to put my head on. Um, Give you that. <laughs> yes, I mean, we've done lots of sort of more Mali type um, play environments. Um, so, you know, on the edge of the desert where we are, have low water requirements um, and not much protection from the elements. So I suppose we always encourage, um, like David was talking about before, the retention of any trees that we might have and working with that asset and keeping that as that legacy that's on site is really important. Um, we always try and look to uh, put in as much natural new shade as possible. So can we get some smaller, more drought tolerant Mali type trees in those environments? Um, using level changes and also um, creating places of refuge for children and thinking about the solar orientation. You know, if we're using some mounds or some walling or can we create, you know, some caves or tunnels or those sorts of things where um, children might be able to skate to for shorter periods of time um, and not necessarily have to have giant say, shade sails over these structures for permanent shade. So trying to draw as much natural shade as possible um, where we can create those places of cooler refuge, engendering water play and misting to cool things down as well, um, and being really considerate about where you actually put your equipment, especially things like hot stuff like rubber and steel, making sure it's south facing and it's shaded, just trying to be really logical about where to create those places of refuge and trying to reduce any heat island effects that you might be um, creating, especially with some of those surfacing um, around rubber, especially, um, and some of those darker colors too. Great, great answer, Amanda. I'm gonna keep coming back to you, you answer well. <laughs> <laughs> so does everybody else. I really appreciate, by Did the way. I remember that, you know, reminded that you guys are all experts in your field and it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, Terry asks the question, can a space be nature play if constructed using off the shelf items? And I'm gonna pair that with a question from Anne as well. It says, what are the classics that clients always want? So you have these clients that have expectations about what they want uh, and maybe that is off the shelf items and maybe it isn't. Uh, Brendan, have you got some thoughts on that? Um, I, I think I think the I'm not sure in terms of the classics, but the what well, I suppose that well no the classics are probably um, loose items in my experience. It's usually the the ability for for children to make things or or pull them down as as per your humpy that you showed earlier on. Um, people kids kids who arrive and find that kids have built something with sticks or logs and so forth, they'll like to enjoy um, exploring that and then trying to make their own. Um, so that tends to be one of the classics in terms of um, nature play is, is, is that sort of loose material and the ability for children to let their imaginations run wild. All right. I think yeah. some of the classics that the question might have referred to too were the ones where clients have an expectation or parents have an expectation of a classic, e.g. swing slide sort of thing as well. And I think that nature play and the, the other can coexist um, and it's just about there was a period of time, ancient last century, where a lot of the budgets to play were directed specifically towards just equipment, just surfacing, perhaps fencing and things like that. And I think what we have has been successfully achieved is a broadening of that so that even the budgets for local play spaces now will consider things beyond the classic swing slide, and that's my interpretation of the question, the classic swing slide, the pretty, which isn't to say that they might be excluded, but the, the slide now may be on a mound with rocks up and down and trees and, and, and grasses in the mound and stepping stones through it. So you build a bit of nature play. You still get the sliding experience, but you get it with a, not a natural, a naturalistic setting. It's never going to be a natural setting. It's an artificial setting that's right. been made, but you can incorporate even at a small scale on local play spaces some of the classics that clients and that adults might need and adults might even need a set of swings there as a marker to say this is a play space 
Because yeah. if they yeah. drive past a vacant block filled with trees and rocks, they might go, well, is that just a block waiting to be sold or is that a nature play space? So sometimes you can stick a little marker in to say, bring them in here and they'll swing for 10 minutes and then they'll run off into yeah. the distance and play in amongst the trees and rocks. So, oh, yeah. And David, you yeah. were going to chip in. Well, I was just going to say, I'm going to agree totally with what Rick was saying. It's, it's, um, it's a combination of both. I think there is, you know, the, the, the swings, the slides, the flying foxes, um, those staples that we always sort of talk about, which draw children in and they may only play on them for a short period of time, but it's about then getting them to migrate from that to playing in other elements um, that may not be defined within sort of a playground area that sort of I guess, blurs the edges of where a playground is and into the rest of sort of whether it's a parkland setting or whatever it might be. And I know when we, we design and look at uh, playgrounds, it's, you know, we, we don't look to define the edge of the playground, that we look to draw in the natural elements uh, within the rest of the park as play. And we try and encourage children to sort of extend out of, you know, what may be defined as a playground because that's where the off the shelf type items might be or the staples might be, but then how do you extend that play experience into those natural environments that are in the parkland setting around it? Great, thanks David. Um, okay, uh, moving along and, and I'm gonna apologize for those of you who think the conversation's jumping all over the place, but the questions jump all over the place and I'm doing my best to corral uh, what is now 55 outstanding questions. I don't think <laughs> Anyway, uh, Two questions here that I think are related again. Uh, one comes from Leia uh, about how do, how do we encourage parents to let their kids get involved in the, in the setting, uh, in a more natural setting of learning uh, to help their scope of development? What are the different ways we can make society aware of the benefits of nature play? Uh, Brendan, that's a pretty broad question, but I'll, I'll let you expound on it for a little while. I think one of the one of the really important things is to encourage um, parents and their kids to um, explore explore nature in, even in urban settings. Um, years ago, I, I was involved in many um, master planning exercises for, for creeks in, in the Melbourne area. And what those master plans did was establish shared trails. Um, and that, so that, what that, what, what that affects, and a lot of those, kilome many kilometres of those trails have been constructed over the last 10, 20 years. And the importance of that is that people in urban environments have you know, their, play, their play settings, but they're also drawn into their local nature and get some um, uh, ownership of their, of their um, natural features, whether it be a local creek or a river. And then what that also opens up is the opportunity for play spaces to be created along those shared trails, which is what, what has happened. And that gives a greater um, appreciation of their local environment, uh, greater appreciation of what they perceive as nature rather than the local park or their back or their backyard, and um, I think that's that's a very critical thing for engendering that um, appreciation with parents and their kids. That's a great point too, Brendan, because it ties into that whole notion of a play space, which has become this kind of isolated microcosm within an urban or not urban environment where you're corralled into this tiny space and you play because the rest of the whole place has been so child unfriendly developed. <laughs> and then once you get back out the gate, go back to being a, you know, a safe and suitable citizen again. And that notion of having little playful bits along the way, as opposed to a designated monolithic play space, but a playful interaction along a walking trail, mm. or even a play space that says, look, if you go and explore beyond the greater environment of this play space, you will need a skill set. And I'm not saying play is about skill acquisition, but mm. you know, you need to be able to balance and engage and these sorts of things. Then you can actually tie that whole playful engagement into the greater urban setting and create a city that is a whole lot less child unfriendly, which is not, I don't want to yeah, distract yeah. us all because yeah. I understand, right. but it's a way of incorporating play into everyday provision yes. that can make it a more, a less monolithic thing and a more experiential thing that can add well-being to the whole day instead of the 20 minutes or half an hour you get to sit in we this have, We talked about here in Tasmania, uh, the notion of the playful city and that the whole city should be considered as a, seen as a potential playground, whether mm. it's hard space or a nature space. And um, I like Brendan's comment about the, 
the Treks and Trails Network in Melbourne and the way it does draw you into places like Studley Park or, you know, the Collingwood Farm and those kinds of things. And, and I think those open space systems are really critical uh, to the ability for people in otherwise dense urban settings to connect into nature. And so I think, again, this is, you know, part of this idea that the, uh, the streets are part of the playground, I think is quite important. Look, lots of questions here. Um, I think this one might be a rapid fire answer from each of you, uh, starting with David. Anna uh, asks, how do you go about getting local children to help in the design of spaces? I think, you know, let's be quick and say, I use this technique once, I use this technique once, I use this technique once, I use this technique once. David, you're on. I was ready to answer it very differently. But um, look, I, you know, I, I think we talk a lot about uh, the physical infrastructure of a playground um, and how important that is, but I think it's the social infrastructure that is equally as important, if not more important. And the more that we can get our children involved and the parents of the children involved in designing our playgrounds, the more that they'll take ownership and understand um, the, the broader reasons and ideas around how we sort of design the playgrounds, they're gonna embrace it a little bit more. So, um, you know, we've used techniques before where we, you know, model making and all these kind of things. And I think there's a lot of people that are probably in the audience that have done very sort of similar. I think there's a lot of work that we've done in this space, but uh, I, I don't think it's done enough. I think we need to uh, to get our children um, and their carers involved in the design of playgrounds much, much okay. better. Okay, Amanda, your turn. To sit down with them, with the paper and the pens and talk to them and learn from the children about actually what they want and how they would go about designing it because they know way more about their play than I do. <laughs> Brendan? Same. I think the, the the whole idea of getting them to draw, getting them to express their dreams and their aspirations and what scares them, what, what makes them happy um, is critical. And then that gives you inspiration to draw that into the thing that you're designing. Right. Rick? Um, it's also an opportunity to go in very open-ended, open-hearted and say, look, we're talking about everything. Later on in the meeting, we'll talk about resource allocation and all the things and help them understand the process of how these places evolve. But if you start very open and very broad, and you can even kick it off by talking about play as opposed to play equipment or play grounds even. Just talk about where do you play? Where do you go when you've got time off? What do you do when you're not doing something you have to be doing? You know, let's talk about the notion of play, how it makes you feel, who you want to do it with, where you want to do it, and then let's see if we can make an environment that accommodates that rather than going in. And that way you get the poetry of the expansive environment as opposed to the shopping list of slide swing slippery dips. Okay, oh, it's good. I hope that answers uh, the question. Um, look, there's a scroll to the bottom of the list because there's a couple of very good ones here. One is um, both from Kate. Uh, question is how do we, first of all, how do we get the insurance companies on board? not just the parents. It's one of the challenges, of course, is that there are Australian standards and they do apply to nature play spaces. And um, yeah, so that, you know, we're not forced into this sort of dulled down uh, idea. So uh, anybody had a, a, a quick uh, question around that? Um, I see that Annabelle wants, sorry, yeah. It's, um, and wants to answer that one herself. Uh, Anna, Annabelle is actually sitting in the background to all of us helping us. And thank you, Annabelle. Do you, um, you want to pipe up? Can you pipe up? No. Uh, no, 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 she says. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Annabelle, for that answer. Um, so can somebody else talk about their experience with an insurance company? Uh, Amanda. I think this is where um, if a client that's really important. If you have a client who's championing what the outcome is and is on board and collectively invested in the outcome, and whether the outcome is slightly messing or expanding on Australian standards, if they believe in the outcome and they're willing to champion it, and you still go through the, the whole rigorous Australian standards, you get an independent audit, there is advice in that audit, ranging from high risk to low risk. If you're able to say to your client, this is a medium risk has been identified, but the benefits are this, and you are desiring this outcome and we've achieved that. If you're willing to then say, 
as a client that you understand and are willing to take on the benefits and the risk at the same time, then the insurance companies need to listen to that um, because you then have someone who's championing that outcome as a client basis. And I think that's where we've really managed to navigate some of those gray areas of the Australian standards is when we have a client who really is invested in the outcome. Right, I, that's great advice. And I think, I think that that engagement I think uh, it points out to me about our role, not as just as designers, but as advocates for what we're doing and as educators about what we are trying to do. Um, and talk, and again, talking through things with people rather than being, uh, and I think most of us are landscape architects uh, and we know that we don't, that's not how we work as professionals. We don't necessarily carry that arrogance about you have to do things this way or whatever. We're open to that discussion and that negotiation, which is great. Okay, um, look, it's coming up again and again in some of these questions, and I haven't read them all, but I know that it's there. The question of, you know, we, we're trying to make nature play spaces that are, uh, you know, have a naturalistic feel and tone to them, and, and we use a lot of natural materials, but that doesn't always um, work for everybody and with uh, different and more challenging needs in life. Uh, uh, can somebody talk to the idea of accessibility in the nature play space? How do we make these places inclusive to people uh, with, with a range of abilities, uh, whether those are physical or cognitive? Anybody have some thoughts on that, the idea of inclusivity? Um, it can be very, it just, it, it's still a welcoming space. It can have opportunities. Um, it depend, inclusion and access is a whole other kind of webinar thingy. Um, and the differences between the two, and I consider access a subset of inclusion because inclusion is much broader than physical access. But when I said earlier, you can't make every space appeal to every person, that doesn't mean that every person shouldn't be made to feel welcome in every space. So you can create very simple opportunities to engage with nature, even in the most simplest of local park. And um, it shouldn't be a budgetary thing that we can't, it should just be a given that inclusion and access are considered in this and it doesn't, it's, um, it's, it's not, it's too easy to just say, well, we can't afford to do this or it's too difficult. Like there's ways to create opportunities for engagement with the seven senses for, um, for um, sight, smell, proprioception. I can never say that word. Anyway, there's all these sorts of opportunities that occur and we need to be mindful of what we're saying when we're talking about access and inclusion and the broad range of, um, challenges that people do and don't have and abilities that they do and don't have. It's very achievable to create nature in a way that is accessible to almost anyone, even in the smallest of spaces. Does everybody agree with that? Anyone want to take Rick on? <laughs> yeah, please, <laughs> please. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at some of the other questions. One of the most valuable components of nature play are loose materials. How can designers integrate loose parts into their creation? As Brendan said, aligning equipment next to vegetation is one. Are there other uh, design opportunities? So maybe, maybe we'll go back to Brendan again and see if he's got some further thoughts. That's from, that question was from Angela, by the way. Yeah, it's um, in regard, uh, I think the, one of the um, ways that's been done um, in, locally here in, along the Darabin Creek is um, there's area, there's large areas of mulched um, space under the trees where there, where council or I believe it's council have, have located large logs, large branches um, um, in these spaces where children can um, create their own humpies, um, 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 cubby houses, and so forth. And they they they're replenished over time, so that then they're just left there. And I think that's. Um, uh, uh, a really um, a good counterpoint as well to being able to explore the creek and to be able to do that at the same time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, look, I, I, you know, the all these natural elements, the, the seeds and the leaves and everything that sort of drop that you find in these sort of natural environments, they're, they're, that's the currency that these children use to sort of exchange and create games with. And I think if you lose that opportunity to have these loose things, you're taking, uh, you know, a great um, experience of the play away from children. So, you know, we've all experienced before where you've got the loose rocks in a dry creek bed or something, and then 
the kids start throwing around. So what, what are the authorities sort of first reaction? Well, just concrete them in or not have them in the first place. And you're taking away, uh, you know, that, that play experience for the children. So I, I think it's an educational thing, as Amanda was saying before, you really need to get everybody involved from the very beginning, explain from the very start, uh, what you're trying to achieve, and these are the elements. But having loose material is extremely important. Mm. Mm. They'll mm. engage with them anyway. If you look closely at a lot of play spaces, like really closely, you'll find under the shrubbery mulch moved away and it'll stick, like there's things happening mm. or an old beer cup filled with berries or whatever, mm. you know. Mm. There are all these little cues everywhere. And if the next time you go to a play space, have a look around, there'll be some, there'll be a little, a can of, tiny stones on top of a big stone, you know, just little engagements and interactions. And they're in a lot of play space or sadly, but excitingly at the same time, a broken off branch because someone's broken off a casual mm. branch to sweep the mulch away to make a clear area for sit, you know, whatever. They're, they're there and we can take cues from that on what mm. they're aspiring to. Plant more casuarina so there's more bits to break off. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, look, I'm gonna. It's uh, getting on 47 minutes, and I I know everybody uh, has other things to do today, but I'd like to. Um, uh, there's one last question here from Alan, about, you know, we've we've been working at this nature play thing for a long time now, or relatively long time, and we've all had different experiences uh, with kickback from parents about loose parts and my kid getting his eye poked out and throwing rocks at passing cars. We've had kickback from uh, the maintenance people who dumb it down and want to uh, make it you know, easier for themselves rather than necessarily better than for the, the people that are actually playing in those spaces. We've had kickback from aldermen, kickback from you know, it, all sorts of people. And um, Alan asked a good question though. Are we finding it, are, is it, are people becoming more accommodating? Are we getting better at explaining ourselves? Is it getting any easier? Um, and what's, you know, what, how do we see it going in the future? Are we just gonna have to keep beating our heads against the wall? Um, so one, once again, I'm gonna go down the list, uh, give each of you one last shot at this, and then uh, I'm gonna wrap up and uh, take over everybody's screen. So David, is it getting easier or getting harder? Uh... Are we getting more adventurous maybe too? Yeah, look, I don't think it's getting easier. I don't think it's getting harder, but there is an onus on us as the landscape architects, as the designers to really sort of drive change. And I think there is a lot of good examples that are popping up um, locally and around Australia um, that are being designed within the constraints of the standards that we have. And, and as the standards start to change, um, I think they'll change in our favor to reinforce this. But I think we can point to other great examples around the country now of where this is being done to demonstrate that change can happen. But it's up to us to really sort of push it and drive it. Right. Amanda? Um, I don't really think it matters to me whether it's been easier or harder. It's my job um, to connect children to nature. And if I can do that in any small way on a daily basis, then that's really the most important outcome of my job, whether it's easy or not. Because without the kids being able to create an emotional connection to our planet, they are not going to champion it in the future. So it's that legacy that we need to keep fighting for. So our kids are empowered to make a difference. Right, Brendan? Yeah, I think it's, it, I think it's the it, it's a continuing challenge that we that we must embrace uh, the things that we the things that are coming on and becoming more important over the over the last 10 15 years like water sensitive urban design for instance can be an actual play element with by using large boulders for instance and retaining walls can become large boulders or um, other natural materials rather than um, uh, clean, uh, clean lines. Um, it's just, it's something that's evolving and, and we always have to meet the challenge and be better at, be better at it um, every year with every job. Right. Rick, last but not least. Uh, I think that, that it's context again. That, that I remember when we started a little crew of us back in the 80s and, and thinking, you know, this is going to last five years. We're going to 
change the world and move on. And there's still things now that are as relevant now, putting into a, a, a you know a, a presentation as it was way back then. Um, one of the conf difficulties, sorry to bring it up, but it's social media and places where people can have an incredibly powerful voice and create difficulties for projects that are trying to proceed. Um, but that is ultimately what we're also doing too. We need to consult, we need to be able to take it all in and manage all of that as well. Um, I think um, kids, you know, it's a bit of a generic kind of statement, but kids love being in nature, but they love being in water parks too and all sorts of other things. I don't see why it would be any harder or any less desirable to have nature spaces than it would be to have artificial spaces. It's a it's about a diversity of opportunity and giving people the opportunity to engage with everything. But the more that we can reconnect people with nature as they kind of separate from it a little bit, um, the more we can create people who can go on, as Amanda mentions, and champion the idea and, and right. keep it keep it relevant. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Um, look. There's 58 of you out there who didn't have your questions answered, and uh, I apologize for that. And I, I can see from the list that uh, many of you are longtime contributors to this discussion and participants in it. And I can also see that there are people here that, are, that, that this, is, this may be new to them uh, and, and an idea that they're wanting to explore and find out more about. And so I would encourage you to continue the discussion um, I want to say thanks to our panelists, and I would expect that uh, they would be open to your questions coming directly to them if the opportunity arises, um, either physically or virtually. Um, it's very lively debate. Uh, it's always good that there are still people wanting more. Uh, at least that's a, a rule of thumb in comedy. You know, you want to leave them wanting more uh, before you, you go off. Um, so in closing, I'd like to thank the panel for their commitment to building better play experiences and their insights into how to do it. I'd also like to thank, again, Lark Industries for their support and encouragement of all of us. And if you could, uh, at the end of all this, when that survey pops up and answer it, that would be fantastic. Uh, I think Lark, I think we all learned something, um, not from the, just from the questions, but the experience of doing this. And so uh, thank you again to everyone and to, uh, to so everyone, uh, until we meet again, I encourage you to uh, stay healthy, stay happy, and stay in love. Thank you. <laughs>